Hi, welcome to our daily encounter. In our reading today in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, we have some very useful information, especially in regards to our battle over sin. Because one of the biggest problems that we have and one of the main reasons that we do fall into sin is the fact that we believe certain lies about sin. Which is not a surprise because uh, we know that Satan uh, uses lies to tempt humans uh, quite often. We saw that in the garden in Genesis chapter 3 when he lied to Eve. Uh, said if you eat this fruit you will not surely die. Uh, for God knows that in the day that you eat it, you will become like him, knowing the difference between good and evil. So a flat out lie by Satan is what caused Eve and her husband, Adam, to partake of the fruit that they were forbidden to eat. John chapter 8 says that Satan is the father of lies. And when he lies, he, he lies due to his own nature. It comes out of his own nature. He is just a, a liar and the father of lies. And so... It would be no surprise that oftentimes we fall into sin and become defeated by temptation because of lies. And what 1 Corinthians chapter 10 will do is correct these lies. First, it will bring out these lies, but then also give us uh, the solution or the answer to these lies. And the first one is, is that sin is not serious. And, and that's a lie that is fed to us. Uh, from the time that we are uh, small children, even on through adulthood, really our whole lives. We're, we're told that, you know, sin is funny. This is definitely a, true in the entertainment world, where um, people are, are portrayed as being in these sinful, sinful situations. And, and it's laughed upon, it's seen as something silly, something to be taken lightly. And if we're not careful, we can fall under that in that same trap as well and begin to think well you know sin is just kind of a funny quirky little thing it's not that big of a deal we might think and be fed the lie that sin is cool oh man if i can if i if i act in this certain way or do this thing man i'll be cool i'm, I'm gonna live a rebellious life and i ain't gonna i'm not gonna try to do what is what is right what is moral what is correct i'm just gonna do whatever I want and, and show everybody how cool I am. Well, that's a lie too. Sin is not cool. And we'll see why in a moment. And we see sin as something that should be desired. You know, something that will that will satisfy us. Something that will bring us closer to our goals. Uh, help us to achieve our and accomplish our goals. Something that will bring us pleasure and satisfaction. Um, but it's not something serious or something that I should take seriously. Or even as Christians, we might think, well, it's okay because I believe in Jesus, uh, the grace of God covers me, and so, you know, if I sin, if I do this, if I tell this white lie, or I do this little act over here, it's not that big of a deal because, again, I'm under the grace of God. Well, Romans chapter 6 and verse 1 says, shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? God forbid. So, uh, definitely that is not true, but these are some of the lies that we are fed and, and lies that we actually believe in regards to sin that that it's very it's not that big of a deal but as we look in first corinthians chapter 10 we're going to see that god takes sin very very seriously uh, and he uses the israelites in their wilderness experience to uh, show us just how serious god takes sin uh, he mentions the time when they uh, worship the golden calf uh, he says do not be idolaters this is verse 7 as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. That's from uh, Exodus chapter 32. And it ended up being that pe that 3,000 people died because of that. They had set up this calf saying, oh, you know, this is the God that brought you out of Egypt. Instead of honoring and worshiping Yahweh, the, the true God that brought them out of Egypt. And so this is a sin that, that we probably think very lightly of in our own lives. When we put other things above God, we think, well, you know, I'm just being a good steward. I'm just, you know, trying to get my ducks in a row. But all the while, we put power, position, money, you name it, even our families can sometimes take the place of God. And uh, it's a very serious thing. In this situation, it, it meant death for 3,000 people. Um, also, the time that they 
acted immoral with the, the daughters of Moab, as mentioned here in verse 8. Nor less act immorally as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. Again, referring to Numbers chapter 25, where they acted immoral with the daughters of Moab. Again, death being the result. Uh, he also mentions them, uh, the ones that tried uh, the Lord. In verse 9, now, Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did, and were destroyed by the serpents. Uh, this is a reference to Numbers 21, where they had been complaining about the manna. God had given them manna, a, a miraculous food for them to eat for the 40 years that they were in the wilderness. And they complained and grumbled. Said, oh, all we have is this manna. Well, uh, they tried the Lord, and the Lord sent serpents. And many of them died because of their, their uh, trying the Lord. Or grumbling. In verse 10, nor grumble as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Uh, these, this is the time when they started to grumble against Moses and Aaron. You know, and you think about their, uh, the situation with Korah's rebellion, uh, where Korah uh, rebelled against Aaron. He said, you know, why are you better than us? Why did God choose you over us? You're no better than we are. Well, because of that, Korah and his household uh, were destroyed. Uh, the ground basically gobbled them up. And, uh, and so death was the result. So in all of these cases, and some of these sins are ones that we wouldn't think are very serious. Um, in all of these cases, it meant death. Um, whether it's idol worship, uh, whether it's uh, just complaining about the food that they ate and trying the Lord in that way, or it has to do with acting immorally. That one we might uh, see is a little bit more serious, but even in our world today, it's not really seen that, as that big of a deal. Uh, or speaking and grumbling against uh, leaders, where it's the leaders of the government, the leaders of our church, leaders in our family, grumbling against them. Those may not seem as very serious sins, but again, all of them resulted in death. Now, I'm not going to say here that, you know, every time you commit one of these sins, God's going to kill you, physically kill you like he did with those in the wilderness. That was a, a special time when God was uh, teaching a special lesson for a particular reason. Uh, and, and that doesn't mean they act that way every time. But we do know that spiritually, death is always the result of sin. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, it says the wages of sin is death. And so... Sin is a very serious thing. It is sin that will keep a lot of people from being able to enter into the joy and the glory of the kingdom of God. And so it's not something to be taken lightly. So in our dealing with sin, we've got to see it for its seriousness. If not, we're going to fall into it every time because we're not going to be too concerned about it. And we'll just flippantly fall into sin and not be that concerned. So that's the first lie we must dispel about sin if we want to overcome it. The other one is, is that all temptation is sin. Um, that's, a, that's a lie that we can believe that if I'm tempted to do something, well, I've already sinned. Uh, here in the scriptures, it tells us that it gives a designation between temptation and sin. In verse 13, it says, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able but with the temptation, we'll provide a way of escape so that you will be able to endure it. So God will help you in temptation to overcome temptation so that you don't sin. And so there's a, there's a difference uh, given here. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse uh, 15 talks about how Christ was tempted in all ways that we are tempted, but without sin. That would be impossible if temptation was the same as sin. We might say, well, what's the big deal whether a person believes that temptation is sin or that it's just something that leads to sin. Well, when we believe that temptation is sin, we're, we're more liable to give up from the get-go. We say, well, because I'm tempted to do this particular thing, well, I've already sinned, so why don't I just go ahead and commit the sin? I've already sinned, so what's the big deal? And, of course, that doesn't make logical sense, but when you're in the midst of temptation, and you're just looking for an excuse and a way to justify your actions, you might say that. Well, you know, I've already thought the thought, so I might as well do the deed. Uh, well, that's that's definitely not true. And just because you've had the temptation, there still remains a chance for you to escape and not commit the sin. And then another lie that we believe about sin is by making the statement, well, I would never, I would never do this. 
I would never cheat on my spouse or I would never lie. I would never do this, that, or the other. That's a very dangerous lie as well. He says in verse 12, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. When you think you're standing, when you think you got it all together, you think you're above sin, that sin cannot touch you, I'm so spiritual, I'll never fall into uh, sin, especially these types of sin, you're setting yourself up for failure and to fall. Um, we have to be humble as we walk through this world and, and realize that this world is a minefield. At any moment, I might take the wrong step, I might do the wrong thing and fall into something I thought I would never do. Think about marriage. How many people on their marriage day thought as they were standing there doing their vows, oh, one day I'm going to cheat on this spouse. Um, you know, but as days go on, as maybe trials and difficulties arise in the marriage, as other people get involved in the situation, eventually a person is carried away and does commit adultery. And just something they thought they'd never do. But it's because they were not, well, one reason it might be is that they were not conscientious of the fact that they could do it and therefore let their guard down. And that goes with, you know, many other sins, not just that one. Another lie about sin that we believe is that my temptation is unique. That nobody has a temptation that I have. Uh, and of course, that is not that that is definitely not true. Here it says in verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you but such as is common to man. The danger of believing that your temptation is unique is you begin to play the victim. Well, the reason I fall into sin because I have to deal with the weight of this temptation. I have this in my life. I have that in my life. And, you know, if other Christians had the same temptations I had, they would fall too. And you begin to believe the lie that, you know, you're justified in committing the sin because of the uniqueness of your temptation. But here the scripture says you're, you have not been tempted in a unique way. Uh, maybe the, the, the particular situations might be unique to you, but the temptations that you're enduring or that you're dealing with are not unique. And so uh, that should uh, stop it right there to say, look, I'm not the only person who deals with these temptations. There's other Christians, other people who deal with these same temptations, and they're overcoming the te the, uh, those temptations. So it ought to be an encouragement to realize that, hey, I can overcome them too because other people are having these temptations and are being successful in overcoming them. And so we should never believe the lie that our temptation is unique to ourselves. Another lie, I am alone in my temptation. In other words, I have to bear the burden of this temptation by myself. Sometimes we can feel like, well, unless I endure the temptation, overcome the temptation in my own strength and through my own ability, then I don't get any credit for it. But here, the scripture says that you are not alone in temptation. And you don't have to endure it on your own. God is there to help you. As you continue to read in verse 13, it says, God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. If you think the weight of temptation is all on your shoulders and you have to overcome it, that would be very discouraging. It would be overwhelming to think that. But when we take the truth that God is faithful. God is making us a promise that He will help us through temptation. He will not allow us to be tempted more than what we are able to endure. But we got to place our trust in Him. You actually get more credit by placing your trust in Him in overcoming temptation than doing it yourself. Um, to do it yourself would be something that could puff you up and make you prideful. But when you faithfully and consistently rely upon God to overcome temptation, then that's a humbling experience where you're giving Him the credit for your ability to live a holy and righteous life. And then the last lie given that we believe about sin is that it is impossible to overcome sin. And he says here, with the temptation, God will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. You can endure it. You can overcome sin. And you have to believe that. If you believe from the beginning, when you start to be tempted that, oh, I, you know, I'm just... I've always fallen into the sin. This is a sin I cannot overcome. You're going to fall every time. And what we do a lot of time is we project our future based upon what we've experienced in the past. Because in the past, I've fallen into the sin countless times. And that means in the future, I'm just destined to fall into the sin countless times again. But once again, we got to fall back on this promise by God that He will help us. He will be our strength. He will be our guide. He will be the one that will help us through it. But we got to trust Him. And so we cannot believe this lie that it is impossible to overcome the sin. So 
These are six lies that we can believe about sin that we need to um, discount with the Word of God. One, that sin is not serious. Two, that all temptation is sin. Three, that I would never commit this particular sin. Uh, fourthly, my temptation is unique. Fifthly, I'm alone in temptation. And then lastly, um, it is impossible to overcome sin. Um, study 1 Corinthians 10 very closely, especially these verses we covered. And think about these lies. How many times have you believed these lies? Combat it with the truth of God contained in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and see if you don't become more successful in your battles against sin. Well, thank you guys for listening in today. I hope you guys have a great day. Love you guys. God bless.